last time he spoke in front of the House Financial Service Committee, he kept saying multiple times, we have not lost a court case on crypto at all. We have brought several actions. And again, remind you, they set, they call settlements wins. And so in their case, they were. They had won every single court case. But now that uh, talking point has really faded because, as you mentioned, the Ripple's case, the Grayscale case, there's also ones like the Coinbase uh, suit going on right now. This content is brought to you by Link2, which makes private equity investment easy. Link2 is a great platform that allows you to get equity in companies before they go public, before they do an IPO. Within their portfolio includes crypto companies, AI companies, and fintech companies. Some of the crypto companies you may recognize include Circle, Ripple, Chainalysis, Ledger, Dapper Labs, and many more. If you'd like to learn more about Link2, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Ron Hammond, who's Director of Government Relations at the Blockchain Association. Ron, great to have you back on. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Ron, it's going to be a busy week. It's already a busy week here in, or in D.C. Uh, tomorrow is, of course, the hearing with Chairman of the SEC, Gary Genser. Uh, tell us about that and what can we expect? Definitely. So um, for those who may not know, Gary Gunsler, the chair of the SEC, is going to be testifying in front of the House Financial Service Committee for the second time this year. Uh, that's a really big deal because remind you, last year, they barely saw him at all in that committee uh, when the Democrats had control. But if the Republicans can control, they want to exercise oversight of the SEC as much as possible. And again, it's pretty typical, though, for the opposite party to try to uh, you know put the screws on to the uh, party that has the White House. But in this case, uh, you know, a lot has happened, both in crypto, but also just generally that it's going to get a lot of flack for Gary Gensler, um, whether it be, you know, on private funds, ESG. Uh, and again, crypto uh, will definitely come up a lot after talking to several folks uh, uh, on the House side. Uh, he recently testified, though, in front of Senate banking uh, two weeks ago, and we didn't get too much out of that, candidly. We saw a couple questions from, uh, you know, Senator Hagerty from Tennessee on the issues of Promethium, for example, and Bitcoin ETF. We also saw some questions from Senator Lummis on SAB 121, which is more crypto accounting standards, uh, and how do you custody um, actual crypto for banks? So I think we're going to see a lot more hard-hitting uh, points from the House, especially on the Republican side. But I also like to ca uh, caveat as well that the shutdown approaching, a lot of Democrats are going to use their time to hit the Republicans. It's just standard politics here. The Republicans are the ones in the House that are really slowing things down, unfortunately, when it comes to funding the government. And so... Any Democrat, uh, for the most part, is going to utilize their five minutes to not really talk about Gary Gensler, but talk about the Republicans shutting down the government. Because, uh, again, that's a major, major thing here. As much as crypto is big for us, right. the macro, all of the shutdown has a lot of implications. So um, you won't see crypto come up too much. But after talking to a couple offices, it does seem like we're going to have some definitely hard hitting questions, uh, very similar to what we saw earlier this year in the House. Yeah. And, and to your point of, you know, things have certainly changed since the last time he appeared because you had the Ripple uh, lo lawsuit decision. You had the Grayscale decision where Grayscale won that. Ripple uh, won a big chunk of, of theirs as well. And and the Prometheum details more about what Prometheum is and what they're up to. So do you think you, there's going to be some hard hitting questions around that, uh, those cases and, and those things that happened? Definitely. So if you recall, uh, last time he spoke in front of the House Financial Service Committee, he kept saying multiple times, we have not lost a court case on crypto at all. We have brought several actions. And again, remind you, they set, they call settlements wins. And so in their case, they were. They had won every single court case. But now that uh, talking point has really faded because, as you mentioned, the Ripple's case, the Grayscale case, there's also ones like the Coinbase uh, suit going on right now. That's got a lot more um, attention, actually. It looks a lot better for Coinbase post those decisions. And so he can't rely back on uh, the courts here or say that, hey, look, I'm winning in all these court cases. And actually, especially in the Grayscale case, he lost 3-0. And two of those judges were Democrat appointees. And they're based here in D.C. And so I think that having that uh, set the tone of like, look, you are really overextending here. And you're losing in the courts, not by a small margin, by unanimous margin sometimes. And so and it's just not crypto. You are pushing the balance elsewhere where other uh, industries like in a, like ESG or like private equity are seeing these wins and saying, you know what? 
I think we're going to actually have a, a chance to win against uh, the SC as well. So mm. uh, like the uh, ETF situation where crypto really just goes out ahead and fights a lot of these fires for more traditional finance. And then those folks kind of benefit from crypto's uh, push. I think we're going to see some of that happening now with uh, the Grayscale case and Ripple case and Coinbase case, uh, empowering other industries who feel like they are also having overreach from the SEC saying, you know what, I think we have actually a case here and we can actually win the courts. Uh, so I think that's going to be a major theme uh, of this hearing going forward. But also there's going to be several other questions to your point about Prometheum. Mm. That was a major issue for that committee, which had Aaron Kaplan in front of that committee just a couple months ago. And right. they reiterate all the talking points. Securities laws are clear. The SEC gave us a, you know, a way to work forward and move things forward. But that argument really uh, fell apart pretty quickly. And we're seeing that uh, in this case, that the Prometheum line that you know there is a pathway forward registration there is a way to comply just doesn't hold water and so i'm pretty sure we'll see some members of congress tighten the screws a little bit there because it's been really uh more of a black box the sec of how this process went uh kaplan just kept saying that you know we actually kept working the sec and they were clear but that is yet to even show itself so i think that'll be a major other theme uh for this hearing as well Mm. Now, you mentioned Coinbase and everyone's looking at that lawsuit. There was also news reported, uh, I think you mentioned it, where Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong will be on the Hill. They've also launched an education campaign around crypto. Tell us about that. Yeah, Coinbase has been a godsend, candidly. Uh, you know, like, again, we used to have only about five or six lobbyists uh, during the infrastructure fight. And again, we're going up against the banks who have over 150 plus lobbyists. We have going against other agencies uh, or sorry, other agencies or other groups that have way more funding. But Coinbase really has stepped up and said, look, the fight's here in D.C. We are committed to the United States and we're committed to resources here in the United States uh, and D.C. to educate Congress, to educate regulators and to you know showcase in D.C. why crypto is important for the future of the United States. Um, and so they're having a huge hill day tomorrow, actually. Again, it lines up not on purpose at all with Kerry Gensler testifying. Um, and of course, also the shutdown, too. But uh, they're going to be having a whole set of presentations for Hill staff and members of Congress to learn from founders. It's not just Coinbase itself. They're also bringing in other founders from other companies and having a whole demo day, a hill day, you can say, mm. to educate uh, various offices. And so I think it's really important to have. We're all seeing a lot of other folks from the industry come down. So uh, it's going to be quite the crypto week here in D.C., of course, bad timing with the shutdown, but, you know, no one can really plan it like that. So uh, we're really excited to see how that you know plays out, um, especially with all the heat recently, more moving to AI uh, in terms of interest, but also scrutiny. I think it's good to ha kind of have more adults in the room and say, hey, look, the, you know, crypto was the AI about two, one or two years ago. We're still here. We're doing, you know, fighting a lot of big battles. We need Congress's help to move uh, the needle. But at the same time, let's show you why this is important and why this technology needs to be in America and not be based elsewhere, because unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of folks migrate over to London, migrate over to the EU. Um, and Coinbase is really taking a strategic stand saying, we're here to stay, we're here to comply with the rules, but uh, we also need some uh, action from Congress. So we'll see how that goes. Sure. Yeah, that's really great that they're doing that. And education advocacy are, are certainly key. Um, and speaking of legislation and regulations, um, obviously, we had the market structure bill uh, get marked up in the House. You also have the stable coin bill. What, what's the latest with those and the next steps? I know the shutdown is probably delaying a lot of things. Uh, what, what are the latest on those items? Yeah, so the, um, we, we were kind of expecting by October timeframe to have a vote on the stable coin bill and the market structure bill. There are other crypto bills as well that passed out of the House Financial Service Committee. But those are the two main big ones. Um, and so the plan was hopefully was after this whole shutdown drama that we would have a vote probably uh, again, October, but it's looking more like November now. Um, and again, our message to folks is the closer we get to that 2024 election, you know, we're almost a year out, all of a sudden all you know bipartisan politics goes away and folks start retreating back to their bases and it's my team versus your team. And that's when everything grinds to a halt in DC. We're already seeing that right now a little bit with the shutdown where folks are saying it's my team versus your team, uh, but the Republicans are a lot more splintered on their teams. And so uh, we want to make sure that we get these bills pushed out of the House on a good bipartisan basis and then showcase to the Senate why it's important to take up this legislation. Um, now, there are been some rumors going around recently, again, Politico report on it, Punchbowl report on it recently, too, uh, that Patrick Henry gave an interview saying, you know, Look, the Senate Bank Committee, my Senate uh, counterpart, 
they're doing completely different things than we're doing in the house. You know, we're focusing on crypto and capital formation and data privacy. They're more focused on marijuana banking, exec compensation, uh, and banking regs. So we are in two different camps on two major different issues. But if we were able to, you know, make a trade of some sort, the priorities at Sherrod Brown, who's running for re-election in deep red Ohio, who's going to need all the help he can get, um, it would really bolster at least his, uh, you know, case to voters saying, look, I'm actually working on this committee that mm-hmm. traditionally has not passed that many bills. Mind you, again, they haven't passed a bill uh, except for this year for four years before that. And that's during his time as well as Republicans mm-hmm. in the chair time. It's crazy. And so in order to this move the needle, they have to have a trade. And I think that's what's really important to say, if this trade were to happen, a lot does have to happen, but this does provide a pathway potentially for crypto legislation to move forward to the president's desk. Again, a lot has to happen. A lot can mess this up. But this is one of the first few times we're seeing kind of a light at the end of the tunnel. And we're really excited by it now, uh, again, but we have to have a lot of education because the Senate has not really given too much thought to this issue besides a couple handful of really powerful champions. Hmm. Yeah, uh, boy, I'm fingers crossed, right? uh, toes crossed, everything, hoping they can get something through the House and and then we can you know go through the Senate. Um, boy, I'm, I'm hoping... I'm hoping something happens, you know, by early next year before the madness of the election cycle. Um, now, there's also the trial for Sam Bankman Fried and F- the whole FTX debacle. In addition, there's been new updates around Sam Bankman Fried's parents and how money was moved to his aunt and Stanford University and much more. Um, what do you expect to happen in October with this trial? So I think the, the main issue that we're going to have here in D.C. is just the noise. Uh, a lot of people are going to be talking about uh, the SPF trial. It does have a huge media attention uh, for better, for worse. Uh, and again, you know, we've really at least, you know, made sure we tell folks in D.C. Again, this is not a crypto problem. This is a complete scammer just using new, newer technology. But guess what? Same old playbook as we've seen with Madoff and others. Um, but there is concern that there are, you know, at least in the case of the House, for example, when we're voting on these big bills. Uh, FTX came up as a reason to support the bill, as a reason also to oppose the bill. Some folks uh, say, hey, look, there's no commingling of customer funds. That's what FTX did. And this bill bans that. On the other end, they're saying, you know, well, this legitimizes the crypto market. So this could potentially make more FTXs come up down the road. Um, And so we've seen FTX kind of being pulled in two different directions when it comes to supporting or opposing legislation. Uh, And so our concern is, of the 300 plus members of Congress who have not sat in a crypto hearing ever before, who may not even know what Bitcoin or Ethereum is, mm. you know, are they going to listen to the headlines and say, look, actually, SPF is all crypto, which we all know it's not the case. Or are they going to say, SPF did this fraud. That's why we need to pass legislation to make sure this doesn't happen again. Uh, and so we're trying to really thread that needle. Uh, of course, you know, we still don't know everything that's going to come out through the trial. There could be some re- regulatory implications. Again, the campaign donations is a major uh, factor and a major reason why a lot of folks in Congress are a lot more, uh, you know, put back by crypto and kind of staying on the away uh, on the sidelines because they don't get burned again. Uh, but as we're seeing kind of recently with the indictment with Senator Menendez recently from New Jersey, um, you know, some members of the Senate took money from his uh, pack, and so there's a lot of you know just. It doesn't matter if you're in crypto. It doesn't matter if you're a Singh senator. There's a lot of issues when it comes to campaign financing as a whole. And a lot of folks are, uh, you know, on their toes here. But I think, you know, we want to make sure that we showcase to folks. SPF kind of went abroad uh, and tried to really railroad the industry here in D.C. by trying to screw DeFi with his legislation and trying to protect his fraud and scam. Uh, let's make sure this doesn't happen again. Let's put some rules on the road uh, because yes, uh, SEC is not providing that right now. They haven't for years. And so it's time for Congress to act. So we'll see how that makes with the dynamics. Um, I'm sure, again, there'll be a lot of DC uh, ties and connections with that court case. So if there's anything damning, we'll soon find out. But uh, our hope is that this actually uh, encourages Congress to act rather than uh, sit on the sidelines saying, now we're good. Uh, crypto is kind of all as we have FTX. And what do you think about the dynamic of, and I don't know if this is going to be discussed in the trial at all, but Sam Beckman-Fried and FTX officials met with the SEC many times. These are confirmed things on the calendar. I believe Sam uh, Sam met with Gary Genser, according to some calendar updates. Um, Does that play a factor at all? Because obviously we don't know what was discussed and what what was the agenda items, but uh, would that bring any pressure on Gary Genser? Like you met with this guy. 
Yeah, he so he said in the New York Times article back in December that he met with uh, SPF, I think it was twice, actually, uh, uh, SPF and Gensler personally. But again, also remind you, it's, uh, you know, it's a big organization. SPF was in D.C. more than any CEO in any industry I've seen in my time in, in D.C. Uh, but the same front, staff meet all the time, too. I mean, it wasn't just SPF. He had a whole team of, uh, of staff that helped out uh, on this front, both the, at the CFTC, at the SEC, um, and, uh, of course, with Congress as well. And so uh, Gensler said, again, explicitly that it was he, he met with SPF twice. But I think it'd be good to know, look, how many times does your staff interact? How long do those conversations go? What do they um, you know, lead to? Because there were some rumors swirling around that uh, FTX is going to get a, a pass of sorts. And again, those are rumors. They're, those We have not had confirmation of that. Um, but the one thing about the court case is that it's going to bring all this to light. Mm -hmm. So if there's anyone that's saying anything, um, you know, half truths here, or they're trying to, uh, you know, protect their character, or protect their image, um, it could really bite them if they have been lying to the press or they've been, uh, you know, giving half truths here. And so, if I were Chair Gensler, you know, if this likely will come up in tomorrow's hearing. Mm -hmm. The question is, like, look, it's going to come out. The truth will come out. We just want to make sure you're shored up here because it's going to be really bad for you. Um, on top of all the other things that have been happening in the courts, if you've been caught, you know, potentially lying here. And again, I don't see any reason why he would in this situation. But I think you know, the focus should be also not just on SPF and Gary Gensler, but when do the staffs and the senior level uh, uh, execs and regulators also meet from FTX and the SEC? Mm. Um, I'm very curious to get those details. Um, now, speaking of FTX, obviously with the relation with Binance, and I forgot to ask you this earlier, uh, the judge recently said the, it blocked the SEC from conducting further discovery, if I'm not mistaken, with Binance US. Or have you heard anything about that? Not as much, at least in the DC front. Uh, but at least you know when it comes to you know the Binance situation as a whole, there's there's still that looming DOJ investigation that a lot of folks in DC are waiting for that shoe to drop. Um, you know, again, there's various rumors of why that DOJ lawsuit hasn't dropped. Uh, mm -hmm. There have been confirmation reports of potential sanction evasion violations as well as money laundering violations by Binance and the parent company, not Binance US, uh, to my knowledge, but Binance. Mm -hmm. um and have you know what is the relationship though between binance us and binance uh you know is there uh, that much cohesion there or is there actually a, a pretty uh separate line between those two entities so um I, one thing's for sure though they're definitely uh, a lot of folks in dc were in the early of 2023 were hearing a lot more from binance they were definitely in dc a lot more trying to get their narrative out um and i think the the mounting uh uh, allegations are pretty damning. And we've seen a lot of folks who were in DC for Binance trying to deliver that message. They're not here anymore. Uh, it was a very short st stint for them. So uh, whether that be for uh, you know the company having financial problems, whether it be more the regulatory issues, that's unclear at the moment. I would lean more to the regulatory issues. Um, but I think it's all going to come more to light as time goes on. Uh, but it's pretty bad. So we'll see uh, exactly how Binance recovers from this, if at all. Uh, but at least here in D.C., the folks that they had speaking, they largely aren't here anymore. Mm. Wow. Um, and final item here, uh, obviously, you got the Gensler hearing tomorrow with the House Financial Services Committee. Is there any other major hearings uh, for the rem remainder of the year that we should be aware of? Not at the moment, at least in terms of big ones. Uh, we are seeing, you know, some small hearings, uh, rumors coming up right now for more of Senate banking. Again, if they do consider crypto legislation, they've only had one major crypto hearing so far this year, whereas the House has had over 13. Uh, but again, like I mentioned earlier, that's just two separate priorities for two separate chairs. Um, but if this trade were to happen, I think I'd just keep an eye on Senate banking. They just had their first AI hearing last week. Um, and as they kind of get more into the AI issues and tech issues in finance, that's going to eventually loop in crypto more and more. So, uh, I think we keep an eye on Senate banking. And then finally, if we are looking for those votes happening, uh, on the house floor for the stablecoin bill, as well as the market structure bill, I probably, you know, keep a little eye on the house as well. Um, and I guess I'll, I think lastly, I'll say now too, um, is tax issues. Uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about securities law, commodities law for quite some time, but tax issues are really uh, percolating to the surface here. Senate Finance, which is um, Ron Wyden, who's a big champion for crypto, uh, on the Democrat side, as well as Mike Crapo from Idaho, they actually put a request out to the industry and, and other stakeholders saying, look, what does taxation for crypto look like? Please help us. You know, what is who should be reporting 1099s? Who should be doing um, you know, various filings and such? 
Uh, so like that's just uh, request ended in early September. And so that we potentially could see some action or at least some legislative hearings on what does crypto taxation look like? Um, and I think it's a very important uh, issue with like the broker definition coming out from Treasury. That's still there's a lot of comments going through that system right now. So we'll see where that lines up. But I keep an eye on tax issues. That's going to be a, a major fight for quite some time. Um, and I think it's going to be really important. It gets a little nitty gritty, but uh, it's very important for any business to operate in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big one. And I know there's been some other things happening. I think the FASB rule and with co uh, corporations being able to hold Bitcoin on, and things like that on their balance sheet. Um, I think, believe there were some updates there. I don't have the full details, but um, there's certainly a, a need for further clarity and and for individuals and, and institutions. Um, Ron, uh, always great information, man. Thank you so much. Happy to help. Thanks for having me.